Good evening and welcome to the 388th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, animation, illustration, and other text image work. It's funded by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation and the New School. Our guest tonight is Alex Berenger. Alex is a professor of English at the University of Montevello in Alabama. He has held fellowships at the University of Cambridge and the American Antiquarian Society. His research concerns 19th century American visual culture, literature, and comics. And tonight, he'll be speaking on his new book, Lost Literacies, Experiments in the 19th Century U.S. Comic Strip. So welcome, Alex. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you, uh, Ben, for, for having me here. I um, When I first heard about the New York uh, Comics and Picture Story Symposium a few months ago, um, I was really excited to be invited and, and started tuning into all the videos. And it's, it's just great. Um, so I guess I'll just dive right in and start talking a little bit about my new book um let me get some slides up here let's see oh boy there we go that's what i'm looking for all yeah. right does that look good mm -hmm. okay fantastic um yeah well um so my new book is on uh 19th century american comic strips um, and, and what I'm going to do is, is kind of skip around to a few moments in the book, um, maybe just to give you a, a feel for some of the highlights and, and sort of the overview. Um, when I began this project, I had just finished my PhD in um, American literature. I had been working on the novel um, as a form and was looking for a second project and, and was really um, interested in um seeing what was in in the world of comics in in that period of, of 19th century american literature um I'd, I'd grown up going to capital city comics in madison wisconsin um and wanted to bring that over to um uh 19th century american stuff and when i began the project i really um thought that the comics were confined to oh what's happening with my slides here uh, to things like this, or at least in, in 19th century America. Um, so these these kinds of broadsides and political cartoons, um, things like uh, this is a, a broadside with, um, I think that's uh, Martin Van Buren and, and Zachary Taylor. Um, Van Buren looking victorious here. Um, he lost that election, by the way. Um, or political caricatures, um, like this famous image from, from Thomas Nast of Boss Tweed. Um, and so that I think is is not only what I thought, but I think that that a lot of um, sort of historians of the period thought. In fact, even now, if you look at nineteenth, or if you look at histories of American comics, they often start with the Sunday comics and with the Yellow Kid, um, with these famous images by by Richard F. Outcault um, in the eighteen nineties. Um, one really important statement in this version of, of history was Colton Wolf's 1947 book, um, The Comics, which begins by describing Outcult's uh, Yellow Kid character as, quote, standing right on the spot when the volcano shot off. Um, and yet, you know, Wolf himself even seems aware that there were comic strips and, and narrative comics, sequential comic art in the U.S. prior to this. Um, I should add, by the way, that I think this hasn't been the case for studies of European um, uh, comics. Uh, scholars like David Kunzel um, and Terry Smulderin in particular have really um, charted a lot of ground in, in books and, and various articles about the European tradition. But, but for Americans, um, I think we're often kind of given to the idea that, that it's, it's this earlier kind of stuff, or it's these... Um, you know, caricature-based single panel types of comics. Um, and so when I began digging in, I was really surprised by what I found. Um, I found not just kind of narrative comics and sequential comic art, but things that were like emphatically comic strips with, um, you know, emphatically stories 
with characters, plots, situational humor. Um, and the more I dug in, the more I was surprised and impressed, not just by the fact that there was a huge, largely overlooked archive of American sequential comics, but also by the sheer variety of different approaches to visual storytelling that I was encountering. Um, during this period when the, the medium of comics was so new and unsettled, artists weren't really confined to a single visual language or genre. So basic conventions of the comic strip, like speech balloons, the use of panel grids, and methods for transitioning between panels couldn't really be taken for granted. Instead, um, what emerged was less a unified American approach to comics than an environment in which competing practices produced multiple ways of experiencing the relationship between the image and text. Um, and even beyond that, artists pursued these deliberately novel ways of telling stories with pictures and combining images, combining images and text. Um, and, and that's where the title of my book comes from, Lost Literacies. Um, what I really wanted to think about was, you know, what was it like to read comics in 19th century America? And I think what I found was that there weren't really well-defined rules. And instead what we find are these like kaleidoscopic shifting approaches. And so the audience for this first wave of U.S. comics um, was strikingly sophisticated. Um, the, the kind of sense of flux, that is the idea that visual language could turn on a dime, was often precisely the appeal of these works. So your average reader, rather than becoming attuned to a single format or reading style, um, took pleasure in novelty. They were always looking for ways that they might need to train themselves to absorb new visual languages each time they open the pages of an illustrated periodical. And even more importantly, I think what that 19th century audience understood was that a comic artist wasn't simply offering like an amusing skit or a bit of commentary. It wasn't just humor, right? When you read a comic, um, you're being introduced to this kind of challenge to imagine visual and verbal experience in, in new and different ways. Um, and so tonight what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll talk about this in three, what I'm calling tableau. Um, I am a classroom teacher, so I know that it's helpful if we get kind of a roadmap ahead of time. Um, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the origins of, of, um, sequential comics, especially in, in, um, America. We'll get into a little bit of New York's printscape that is, the culture and the kind of network of relationships that that made comics go. Um, and then finally, and we'll get into one of my favorite subgenres of the, the period, and that's travel comics with, with Augustus Hoppen, who also happens to be one of my favorite artists of this period as well. Um, so let's start there, tableau number one. Um, the story my book tells really tends to start in the 1840s uh, when we see the beginnings of the first tradition, first consistent kind of tradition of, of what I think of as American comic strips, that is sequential art that that um, uses either captions or speech balloons, you know, to tell a story. So this activity of combining images and text. Um, and before that, there were scattered attempts to create things that look an awful lot like comic strips. Um, so I know that that one of the images that Ben was really interested in um, when when we first started talking was was this from from DC Johnston in the 1820s and 1830s. Um, Johnston was a Boston-based artist and printer who was known as the the Cruikshank of the New World, um, and he was really probably the first um, successful or uh, well I don't want to say first, but he was a very successful comic artist and somebody who's really thinking a lot about sequences of, of images um, alongside captions and, and doing some of this kinds of storytelling. Um, what we're looking at here is a comic sketchbook by Johnston. Um, and this is from 1833. And it's one in his series, which was called Scraps. Um, and these could get incredibly elaborate. Um, this installment of Scraps had like an index where you would read, it was like you're reading quotes from this travel book by uh, Francis Trollope. And then uh, uh, Johnston would go ahead and, and illustrate and, and kind of make fun of 
the these um, quotes from the travel book through various kinds of um, quotations and, and caricatures and stuff like that. Um, and these were really successful for a short time. Uh, Johnston, in my records, had subscriber lists of something like 3,000 people, which, which is significant for the 1820s. Um, but he's not really able to, to um, sustain that kind of success. And it really, at least in my opinion, um, doesn't pick up a lot of steam as far as gathering imitators or anything like that um, in, in any sort of meaningful way. So where we really start to see a consistent audience and tradition of sequential comic art is with the introduction of French and Swiss picture stories into the, the um, landscape of American print culture. Um, so in 1842, um, what we see is this publication called The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck. Um, and I think a lot of the people on this call maybe are aware of this, this document, but essentially it's a bootleg of Rodolphe Terpfer's uh, Monsieur Vieux-Bois, right? And Rodolphe Terpfer was, was a Swiss artist who was notable um, for developing really the, the, what we think of as, as the modern comic strip format, really kind of whole cloth. It seems to come out of nowhere with Terpfer. And so American um, uh, publications start getting a hold of this, specifically um, the publication Brother Jonathan. Um, and, and they start copying Terpfer's work, you know. And these are really neat documents. So Terpfer's, uh, what he's working with are, are these graphic albums, right? And there are these like kind of oblong volumes. Um, and so this is, this is an example of um, a Bachelor Butterfly, and this is an American bootleg of, of a Rudolf Terpfer work. Um, you know, and, and they're cool, right? They're like these oblong volumes and, and they're kind of proto graphic novels. Um, and these, these kind of graphic albums, like what Turpfer uh, was creating and what American artists were bootlegging in both magazines and, and graphic albums, that format lasts for about 20 or 30 years in the United States and has a little bit of success um, with things like the fortunes of Ferdinand Flipper, which is a um, kind of series of, of really kind of ripoffs and copies. Um, to things like the wonderful and thrilling adventures by land and sea of Oscar Shanghai, um, which is an American uh, composed uh, graphic album. Okay. Um, but where things really seem to pick up steam in the American tradition um, is with uh, comics making their way into humor magazines. Um, and so in 1852, what we see is, is T.W. Strong, that's the publisher's Yankee Notions. And this publication, I think more than anything, um, more than any single force in the American landscape, um, helped uh, introduce readers to that format of the picture story and, and getting used to kind of thinking about um, comics sequentially. And in the first year, they published a work that was um, really a, a kind of homage um, to Terpfer called The Adventures of Jeremiah Oldpot. Um, and, and this one from Yankee Notions featured some truly like madcap gags. Um, so uh, what they're doing is, is making fun of kind of American entrepreneurship and, and consumerism and, and stuff like that. Um, Jeremiah Oldpot is this guy who's going to be panning for gold in the West. Um, and so what we can see on the left, for instance, is that he's, um, Old Pot is, is working with like a merchant who's going to sell him all sorts of stuff, right? So he's got the um, electro galvanized suit, which, which blows up like a balloon, right? Um, and then uh, he's got this, this kind of like Eskimo looking thing in the bottom where it's where, you know, he's being shielded from all sorts of stuff. Um, and one of the kind of wickedest gags in this is on the right, where what you see is all of Old Pot's children um, looking at him in these kind of strange costumes and stuff. Um, and, and what's happening is their eyeballs have like popped out of their heads and, and so they're um, floating away like butterflies, right? And so you can see Old Pot's wife like trying to catch all of the eyeballs that are like flying around um, in the frame. And in the truly savage twist, 
um, the dog is trying to catch the eyeballs too. Uh, pretty, pretty funny stuff. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting about that first run in Yankee Notions is um, that that it wasn't actually an American comic at all. Um, what we've, what I found when I started kind of digging around was that um, Strong had taken French comics um, and actually drawn over um, the the plates, or, or not drawn over the plates, but probably redrawn and then engraved them. Um, and so what we can see here, for instance, is this is from a comic, a picture story by the, the French artist Cham, which was appearing in a French magazine, Le Illustration. And then we can see where um, on the right, uh, uh, the artist for, for Jeremiah Olpot has drawn like a coonskin hat on him, you know. And I think to me, part of the reason why that's really interesting is that it tells us that um, people like T.W. Strong, right, these publishers, were really steeped in um, these French and Swiss picture stories and really steeped in, in French and Swiss magazines, um, which were, were, of course, you know, publishing lots and lots of sequential art through the 1840s and 1850s. Um, I think it's also, and, and part of the reason why somebody like Strong is able to get going like this is because of, of the kind of cultural and, and business location of where he's at. Um, so in the, the 1850s, New York is really becoming, and, and this is, of course, Manhattan Island, um, New York is really becoming a hotbed for um, the illustrated press, right? Um, so not only creating uh, comics, but all sorts of, of different kinds of illustrated and non-illustrated publications. Um, the area along Nassau and Fulton Streets, uh, which would become known as Newspaper Row, was dotted with upstart publishing houses that catered to a working and middle-class demand for the spectacle provided by inexpensive printed images. Um, and these publishers enjoyed a kind of editorial freedom that came with, with loosened restrictions um, in the 1850s. Um, and so I'm gonna skip that slide. Um, what we can see here though is, is like an image of T.W. Strong's shop, right? And why something like this is significant is that you can see how images um, are a kind of spectacle. Right. So what we're seeing in this image are people kind of gathered around um, his retail store. Right. So so strong is this printer who's, who's putting out not just comics and humor magazines, but all manner of, of different kinds of um, printed goods. Right. And people are viewing this as a, as a kind of spectacle. Um, and all along the way, T.W. Strong, this really formative publisher, Right, is experimenting with things that that look like comics, right? So they're really like working their way up to it. Um, this is a um, comic almanac that that Strong had worked on. I believe this is with Elton, uh, but we can see, and, and this is a kind of detail view um, where you know it's not exactly maybe what we would think of as a comic strip, but it's getting awfully close, right? And Strong and, and other publishers in this period are working with all manner of printed goods um, that are kind of thinking through the relationship between images and text. Um, so this is a T.W. Strong accordion book, right? And what you would do with something like that is um, you'd, you'd stretch it out and you'd flip the letters, right? It's for children, right? And it's, I think, you know, we're seeing that kind of aspiration of making images sort of move like that. Here's another one called Sailor Boy from T.W. Strong's publishing house. Um, and this one you, you fold up and, and you kind of flip and it's showing um, like the growth of a child, right? From a kind of sailor boy into um, rear admiral, right? Like an older man, right? And so you're alternating between um, things like the, the captions that are that are on the underside of it, right? And then these images showing the scenes of the child's life, right? Um, and, and even 
things like this. So th this is the first run of um, Yankee notions or the first year of Yankee notions. It's, it's all the covers kind of laid out um, on a single broadsheet. And I have to thank Rich West, who I, I see is on the call for, for showing me this wonderful image. Uh, but this is another example of, of T.W. Strong, right? Experimenting with things that, that look an awful lot like, um, you know, that alternation of image and text that sequencing of, of images that you would see in the comic strip. Um, and so when this emerges out into the kind of broader world of comics, um, what we see, I think, is this really like interestingly gimmicky approach to comics. Um, so that that Strong and other publishers, and these are uh, the one on the right is from, from Strong's Yankee Notions, and then the other two are from Harper's Monthly. Um, but these are all kinds of like thought experiments on, you know, how do you do graphic narrative? Um, this one is a comic called Egyptian Intelligence. And like a lot of these, it, it's created solely as a one-off, right? Um, invented, the, the visual language is, is kind of just a thought experiment that they're working with. Um, and in this case, what we're looking at is this kind of elaborate visual puzzle. Um, it's supposed to be Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, and so as a reader, what you're doing is you're kind of looking at the mysterious hieroglyphics um, and then going down to the index at the bottom of the page, right, and trying to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, and, and the kind of solution to this one is that um, what we find out is we're looking at like the college lives of, of ancient Egyptians, right, and, and Thebans. And, um, you know, they're worrying about all of the things that like normal, I don't know, 1850s college students worry about. That is, you know, they're, they're thinking about their dating life. They're worrying about the clothes they're wearing. I suppose in that case, it would just be loincloths. Um, you know, or they're thinking about presenting their thesis, right? Um, you see a lot of experimentation with captions, right? This is a really rich source of experimentation. This is a comic called Four Experiences in Waltzing. Um, and I like this one because um, it has this little invitation at the bottom saying, you know, for explanation, the unmusical reader will consult any lady in her piano. Um, and what's neat about it is, is that you can play the, the piece, right? And it corresponds to the things going on in the frames, right? So in frame one, we have a relatively moderate, you know, kind of waltzing pace in, in uh, frame two, right? You can see the tempo picking up. You can see the key signature getting a little weird. Frame three is just chaos. And then frame four, it's it's this thing where he, he falls on his bum, you know, and you get a fermata that is this kind of grand pause. Um, Shadows Over the Way is one of my favorite comics that experiments in this way. Um, and what we're seeing here is a comic that places readers in the perspective of a voyeur who peeps into a boarding house and experiences the resulting scene as an impromptu shadow puppet show. So curtain windows create a series of images uh, where the figures inside uh, create this kind of cast of characters. Um, so we see a child taunting a parent, couples kissing, a boxer taking a cheap shot. And at first glance, these frames might look sequential, right? They might look like they're kind of leading in to one action to another. Um, but if we look more closely at them, what we find is that it's actually just kind of um, isolated individual frames. Uh, but the artist here is doing kind of repetition of, of sort of shapes. So for instance, the large husband and the small wife in, in frame one um, are kind of repeated in frame two where you get the child and the father, right? So it's giving you both that kind of in the moment synchronic kind of perspective, but then also a, a sort of sensation of, of um, movement, right, and sequence. Um, and you also saw artists experimenting with um, putting panels on, on each kind of page. So this is a comic from um, Knickknacks for All Creation, which was kind of a peer um, periodical to, to Yankee notions. Um, but what's happening is, is in the lower right hand frame, or rather in the lower right hand corner of each magazine page, you have a new installment of the comic. 
Um, and this particular comic is called Man with a Gold Watch. So as a reader would flip the page, um, they would get a new installment or they'd get a new kind of frame, you know. And, and I really think that these were created really, I think, precisely with this kind of page flipping in mind, you know, where um, you have this, this man, uh, the premise of the comic is that the man is paranoid about people losing his gold watch. So, or uh, taking his gold watch. So here he's on guard for, for thieves, right? And here the police bust into his uh, room. Here we have the police uh, mistaking him for a thief, proceeding to arrest him. Um, and then in the final frame, what we have happening is that, that he's uh, been returned to his boarding house after having spent time in jail uh, with his watch mysteriously missing. So the police stole his watch. But I think it speaks to that kind of experimental quality of those early uh, comics. You know, they're, what, what the publishers are doing really is kind of throwing any gimmick they can think of at, at readers, right, to kind of generate interest. Okay. Tableau number two, New York's Printscape. So apart from... Um, these commercial and technological developments. Early U U.S. comic strips are bolstered by New York's artistic and literary scene uh, from the 1850s to the 70s. Um, and at this time, an unprecedented number of cultural workers migrated to Lower Manhattan, attracted by economic opportunities um, and, and the kind of broader social life there, right? And the resulting concentration of creative types led to this cosmopolitan atmosphere just unparalleled anywhere else in the United States. Um, and these writers were really different than previous generations of, of artistic types um, in the US. Um, unlike previous uh, generations, um, the figures who gathered in mid 19th century New York really dwelled at the fringes of polite society and pursued social mobility through cultural labor. Right, so they're not held up by patrons. They're not independently wealthy. Um, these are people who need to to create, like art. People who need to create writing for a living, right? And it, it creates this really kind of fascinating atmosphere. Um, and so, writers, artists, actors, um, editors are regularly meeting inside restaurants, bars, cafes, uh, places like Crook and Duff's, Delmonico's. Fops, where they drank beer, ate German pancakes, and discussed discuss creative endeavors. Um, they lived together in boarding houses. They loafed about the streets in search of entertainment, even as they maintained this kind of punishing publication special, or schedule just to make ends meet. Um, and out of this milieu emerges new approaches to American literature and art shaped by urban life and dedicated to a broad egalitarian version of republicanism. This newer brand of literature and art was best conveyed by Whitman's innovative verse and bold assertion that the roughs and the beards, the vast masses, were really what gave the United States its fullest poetical nature. Um, Whitman not only frequented many of the same restaurants and bars as the period's comic artist, but also traced the artistic origins of his work as a journalist um, to, or rather trace the origins of his work to his journalistic work, right? Um, and so like the comic artists, right, he's, he's living in this kind of world of journalism and this world of, of cultural labor, right? Where he's recording the city's happenings, right? Um, and this kind of journalistic ethos and this urban ethos is echoed in, in um, countless arrays of, of artworks and, and literary works of the period uh, by figures who, like Whitman, were influenced by this social and intellectual milieu of, of New York's print culture. Uh, figures like the painter Winslow Homer, who expanded his subjects beyond the well-born and wealthy, the actor Frank Chanfro at the uh, right, who achieved fame by playing the working class Bowery boy Mose, Fanny Fern, who gained a national following through her uh, acerbic newspaper col columns, commenting on the lives of middle-class women, and the fiction of Mark Twain, whose breakthrough story, The Celebrated uh, Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, was published in the Saturday Evening Press. Um, and 
I think one of the big themes of the book with reference to this, this new kind of brand of American literature and art is that there's this really robust set of interactions between comics and what we think of as, as kind of mainstream um, works of, of American literature and art, right? So there's not this kind of, I think, separation between the canon and the comics that, that we might otherwise imagine, right? Um, comic artists were really integral figures in the, the array of personal, professional, and artistic relationships that sustain New York's publishing and entertainment scene. Um, for instance, Thomas Butler Gunn, um, who was a British expatriate, characterized uh, the prolific artist Frank Ballou as a fixture among New York's cultural luminaries, regularly spotted in Howell's Tavern alongside the likes of the poet Whitman, Bohemian editor Henry Clapp, and actor John Brougham, Frank Blue was said to recognize and be recognized by everybody. According to Gunn's fanciful account, Blue carried a black valise that contained boxwood and not shirts, and when the evening was over, could sketch any of the tavern goers with his eyes shut and one of his hands tied behind him. Um, now that's kind of maybe a little bit of exaggeration, um, but I think what's really significant here is that that we this is from a, a um, article by Gunn called "The Restaurants of New York," um, and what we're looking at here is is this kind of uh, scene of what it's like inside um, Howell's Tavern, right? And so you see Baloo alongside Henry Clapp, alongside Walt Whitman, alongside figures like John Bruham, and in the visual records we have. Um, Comic artists are, are seen wearing elaborate facial hair, foreign clothing, deliberately gaudy accessories, and other elements that identify them with what we might think of as romantic subcultures. This is a striking page uh, from Gunn's notebook containing an illustration that depicts John McLennan, who's on the left, and Thomas Nast on the right, loafing about New York dressed in attire that really would have caused a stir among polite company. Um, so John McLennan, um, that's that figure on the left with his walrus mustache, loose fitting frock coat and fishing hat, um, sports a combination that signals both his identification with working class roughs and an affinity for nature. Nast on the right wears a Calabrian hat that he would have gotten in his time as a um, uh, illustrated, um, or rather an artistic correspondent in Italy, and facial hair trimmed to look uh, like the Sicilian troops that he encountered during that tour. And these urban origins of figures like Blue, McClendon, and others emerged in their comics freewheeling and expansive sensibility. And this spirit could take many forms. In some cases, it meant uh, shifting the kinds of subjects deemed appropriate for comic drawing, so like the broader social world of, of Whitman's comic or poetry, comics engaged with a larger, more inclusive version of American uh, culture. Uh, they developed rich situational comedy arising from chance encounters in public spaces where urban toughs and newsboys cohabited with Yankee rustics, effeminate swells, and fashionable women wearing hoop dresses. They presented readers with a parade of outcasts, artists, animals, mischievous children, and other interrupters of polite social order who didn't conform to the stultifying conventions of bourgeois society. For example, this is one of several exploding pig cartoons that Frank Ballou created in keeping with um, what a, a kind of transcendentalist inspired philosophy of what Ballou called merrymaking where unpredictable acts of silliness offered occasions to gain relief from the pressures of modern life and reconnect with nature. Um, Ballou, by the way, is an absolutely central artist for the US in this period. Um, if you remember one name from my talk, it, it probably should be Frank Ballou. He's, he's just so formative. Um, and a big part of the case that I'm trying to make, uh, especially in my section on Ballou, is that we can see these kinds of mischief cartoons as part of that same kind of artistic and literary revolution that gave us Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau, and Fuller, um, and really is kind of, even as, even as they're kind of in with these kind of canonical figures of American um, literary culture, 
right? They're also identifiable as, as precursors to the Sunday funnies, right? So the chaos of something like Frank's Baloo's, Frank Baloo's Exploding Pigs really reminds me a lot of, of like the Cats and Jammer kids, you know, that kind of rough and tumble slapstick. Um, another one of Baloo's series is, or, or um, is um, Master Charlie, right? Which to me reads very much like a clear precursor to um, uh, Buster Brown, right? With the kind of polite, kid who keeps getting into scrapes. Um, and Baloo even has stuff that that seems to prefigure uh, Windsor McKay's Little Nemo in Slumberland and Dream of the Rare Bit Fiend. Um, so this is a comic called Mr. Bulbear's Dream. Um, and the premise here is that Mr. Bulbear, who's a stockbroker, has had like this really rich dinner at, at Delmonico's, right? And then has these unusual dreams. In this case, he's um, imagining himself or, or hallucinating himself as a giant goose, right? And then much like um, McKay's Little Nemo, um, he falls out of bed and wakes up only to find that it was a dream, right? Uh, but this influence of kind of New York's literary and artistic culture um, is wide ranging. So you see a lot of comics that are drawn directly from the theater district, right? So this, for instance, we're seeing the the um, text displayed in play script, right? They're recreating theatrical scenes that, you know, they, they could have walked just a few blocks from Newspaper Row down to Broadway, down to the theater district. And so it loops around and makes its way back into the comics, you know? Um, you also see a lot of comics that, that have this kind of subversive edge where they're showing a kind of unseen or unsavory side of American culture, um, you know, so exposing kind of scandalous scenes of drunkenness. Um, this one's called The Ways of the Singer, right? Um, or things that could be really ambitious. So this is uh, uh, an image from one of my favorite stories in the book. Um, and it's an image from um, Knickknacks when Mary Levison had um, taken over the the um, magazine. Um, and what had happened was, was that Mary Levison was, um, her husband had formerly owned, had been a co-owner of Knickknacks, um, and he passes away. And rather than passing the magazine off to somebody else, um, Mary Levison seems to change it, right? So what you start seeing in Knickknacks um, through the 1860s are the ads changing from being kind of um, catered towards men and, and the comics and the content being catered towards men to being catered towards a kind of broader audience. Um, so you see ads for women, you see comics like this popping up. Um, and so this is a kind of theatrical masquerade scene uh, with very direct uh, references to drag performance and queer expressions of queer desire. Um, so in the image on the left, for instance, um, you can see, what is it, Sister Sue, who's plotting to, to um, seduce Sally uh, later tonight. And then Sister Till tells her, well, if, if you behave like the men, um, you're not going to have any luck, right? Um, so kind of interesting stuff coming out of New York in this period. Okay, Tableau 3, Augustus Hopton Abroad. Now, one of the things that really fascinates me about comics in this period is the way that we have all these kinds of subgenres that seem like they have a promising future, but never really quite get off the ground. Um, you know, so I talk, for instance, about character studies and sketches in the book. Um, I talk a little bit about this whole kind of subgenre of theatrical comics. Um, and, and I also talk about this subgenre of travel comics. Um, and I like this because it reminds us that when we're thinking about the medium of comics or graphic narrative, there are a lot of different routes that things could have taken, right? A lot of potential like futures that were imaginable. Um, and so with these 19th century American comics, one of the very first things that artists do is they get a hold of the, the Swiss and the French comic uh, picture stories is they start doing travel comics, right? Um, the Gold Rush, there's a whole like host of, of graphic albums specifically about the Gold Rush, and it seems to kind of fit perfectly into 
the zeitgeist of the time, right? There's this kind of rage for going west. Um, and it also maps on very, very neatly to just the kind of basic format of the picture story. But we see other kinds of themes too. So for instance, there's a whole kind of um, array of comics based on encounters with uh, the Jersey mosquito, right? And so these are these comics that, that show up in, in humor magazines, especially about these giant mosquitoes that, that harass and harangue people. I think of them almost as like precursors to like Looney Tunes or something, or maybe Woody Woodpecker. Um, but the figure who I get really interested in with the travel comics is Augustus Hoppin. He's probably the most prolific 19th century artist for this type of comic. Um, he he de developed various iterations of the travelogue strip over the course of about 30 years in both magazines and picture books, uh, with his first travel comics appearing around 1852 and the last of them appearing in 1880 or so. Um, and the style of, of visual storytelling that Hoppin deploys will look relatively unfamiliar to comics readers today. Um, these don't really reflect the kind of like fluid motion that we might expect with, with comics um, associated with, or rather influenced by like the cinema or the zoetrope or, or those kind of later technologies. Um, instead, they're really kind of thinking of, about scene to scene transitions, right? How do we kind of move from place to place? But even more than that, they're thinking about the psychological development of the traveler as, as they're moving along. So one of the great paradoxes of travel comics in this period is that they feature very, very little scenery, right? Um, they, they focus almost entirely on um, the image of the person as they travel, right? Um, so, you know, and, and we see this coming out in the reviews. Um, one of Hoppin's early reviewers will write, as all know, an apparently careless etching is usually far more spirited and natural than an elaborate steel engraving. Mr. Hoppin's etchings tell those who have not been in Egypt far more about the country and its wonders and its ways than even a series of photographs. Um, another credited Hoppin's ability to capture a more correct and satisfying impression of places and people abroad, abroad than volumes of mere words. And they attributed this to the fact that his sketches were the thought of the moment, inspirations that were taken on the wing, done on the spot, right? So the idea with, with travel comics really is that these are little kind of sketches that are just sort of thrown off and capture an artist's emotions in the moment and, and their kind of thought process. Hoppin's earliest published travel comic is this thing called Jonathan Abroad, um, and this is appearing in the very first volume of Yankee Notions, um, or maybe it's the second one. I don't know. Somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong about it. Um, but anyway, in adapting his his travels, what Hoppin's doing is is kind of vacillating between um, this register that that looks an awful lot like kind of the humorous sketches that you would see in in Yankee Notions, a lot like Jeremiah Oldpot, right? Um, and stuff that's a little bit more serious, right? A little more genteel. Um, so the early installments of, of Jonathan Abroad really have Jonathan like goofing around a lot. Um, this for instance is a scene where he's in England, right? He's in London and we see him in the ball at St. Paul's and we see him being kind of confused by people at the Royal Academy. So he's looking at, at people looking at these paintings and, and kind of saying to himself, well, you know, what's so special about all these funny pictures? Later installments of Jonathan Abroad um, get a lot more genteel, right? Um, so here's an image, for instance, on the left, um, Jonathan is so charmed by this glove saleswoman in Paris, right, that he just has to purchase um, gloves from her, right? I mean, it shows this more kind of sensitive side to the artist. And in fact, these comics from Jonathan Abroad um, would serve, I think, as an inspiration for some of the publications of uh, Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad. So Twain, uh, Twain's publisher uses a lot of the same kinds of techniques that we see with Hoppin's um, Jonathan Abroad, but maybe even more significantly, 
um, Twain actually rips off a couple of Hoppin's um, vignettes. So for instance, this vignette about um, being charmed by the glove saleswoman, right, that pops up in Innocence Abroad, right? Um, so we at least have some evidence that, that writers are reading these comics, you know, and they're reading like travel comics like that. Um, and I think with Hoppin, something that's even more interesting is that a lot of what's going on underneath the surface is that he's actually traveling as he's doing these comics, right? So these are some, some sketches that um, are at the American Aquarian Society, and they're hand-drawn kind of little sketches that Hoppin was doing um, as he was doing what was called the Grand Tour of Europe. Um, and they have a kind of comics-like quality. So this is sort of happening underneath the surface with Hoppin, right? Um, and as his career continues, um, his, his travel comics get more and more sophisticated. Um, so on the left, we have, the, this is from Jubilee Days, which was Hoppin's kind of visual reporting of um, the Grand Jubilee in Boston. Um, on the right is Crossing the Atlantic, which was a, a personal um, travel album that, that Hoppin had done, right, with, with his experiences of going abroad in the 1870s. Right. And a highlight among Hoppin's um, later kind of travel comics is his humorous piece uh, called Hay Fever. Um, and this is this very funny send up of what was known as hay fever tourism, where people would travel to resort areas and faraway destinations to escape allergies in the spring. Or at least that's what they claimed they were doing when they were traveling. Um, right. And so Hoppin's album follows this character named Mr. Weepy, who suffers from allergies and, and travels throughout the United States in search of regions free from nasal irritants. Um, and the book's central gag lies with the irony that the psychic and the spiritual renewal imagined by 19th century travel writers consistently fails to offer any sense of relief. So throughout the book, right, Mr. Weepy is kind of going to exotic locations and he keeps sneezing and he's got this gigantic handkerchief box. Here he is with some play, prairie dogs, right? But where Hoppin eventually lands is not on the uh, comedic, but instead on the genteel and the realistic. Um, and I find his book On the Nile to be the most significant of Hoppin's visual travel logs because it marks a really concerted effort to push graphic narrative into increasingly ambitious directions. Um, in many ways, it attempts to imagine the expansive possibilities for what could be accomplished through visual storytelling. Um, and unlike a lot of these earlier works, On the Nile demands a much slower and more involved style of reading. The book features long blocks of the crastic description accompanied by intricate photorealistic illustrations and much of this is done to facilitate the rich variety of perspectives and subjective experiences that Hoppin's hoping to achieve through visual storytelling. Most commonly, Hoppin adopts a style that incorporates multiple overlapping visual modalities. And in doing so, he achieves a kind of dual subjectivity. Um, in introducing his readers to multiple perspectives, Hoppin really kind of interrogates the tensions and complexities of the tourist's gaze. And in particular, he invites his reader to question the extent to which the gaze of the tourist is determined by consumerist ideology. Um, such moments of self-reflection cast on the Nile as a book really preoccupied, not just with telling jokes, not just with um, you know, conveying what it's like to be in a place, but to really tutor his audience on how to look, right? What it means to be a responsible tourist. So for instance, in this image that we're looking at here, um, what we see are, are scenes of tourists looking at, right, scenes of tourism. So that figure in the lower right is, is Hoppin's traveling companion. Um, and just above him, we're seeing a, um, a, a, an Egyptian man being checked for, for like an eye disease, right? Um, and so on the one hand, these images are calling attention to this idea that the Westerner is looking and enjoying tourism, but then Hoppin's captions really kind of subvert that idea, or at least ask us to think in more complicated ways. So he'll write, 
of course we're supposed to ignore for the moment the distress and poverty and general wretchedness of the people and to form our judgment simply from the picture before us. Um, and so this carefully manicured image that presents in Hoppen's words, only romantic clusters of white villages really needs to be like re-examined. Um, and so the effect is to really ask us to revise our viewing practices. Um, you know, and I think that that for me, when I look at images like this, what I'm seeing with with somebody like Augustus Hoppen is somebody who's looking at travel comics and not thinking of this as like a genre that's going to stop, right? He's thinking of it as like, this is the future of comics, man. I mean, I think that's what he's saying, right? And as a kind of broader point, and, and I'll close with this, um, I think that it speaks a little bit to, um, I think, asking, or at least what I would like us to do is question maybe um, this teleological kind of sensibility that we sometimes have of comics going from less sophisticated to more sophisticated, right? As if there's some kind of path from, um, you know, kind of the simplicity of the Sunday funnies, which, you know, I mean, I think we know aren't, aren't simple at all, up to kind of figures like Chris Ware or Alison Bechtel or, or Emil Ferris, who are, who are really kind of deconstructing the form. Um, we can see somebody like Augustus Hoffman in the 1870s really attaching um, some serious kinds of ambitions um, and even then kind of deconstructing the form. Um, and so I can't help but think that that appearance of like stability through the 20th century is really an illusion. Um, and that this idea of experimenting with the comic strip um, was really there from the start. Um, and so that's where I'm gonna leave it for the formal part of my talk. Um, and I guess we can kind of open it up to, to questions or discussion or, or anything like that um, now. Sure, you can put your question, or put your name in the chat or just unmute yourself if you have a question or comment. Yeah, and I do see in the chat, the Fox illustration, um, that is, let me see if I can pull that up. So that's an illustration. Um, I've seen that one attributed to Frank Ballou, though I'm really, really skeptical. Is that up there? No, am, am I successfully sharing this? I'm not, am I? Let me let me share the, the image again. Uh, and this question was coming from, um, from Randy. Okay. So Randy's talking about this Foffs image. Um, I've seen this image, so this is, this is an illustration for sure. This, I think, so the Whitman one is a, that's a photo. Um, and that's from the, that's much later. This is a um, piece that William Dean Howells did as a kind of retrospective. Um, but this image of Foffs is a um, illustration. I've seen it attributed to Frank Ballou. I don't think this is Frank Ballou. Um, I think Rich West may have some thoughts on that. Um, but, but I don't think this is Frank Ballou doing this one. Yeah, the Whitman image. Yeah, that was a photograph. Really? You sure about that? I think so. I don't I think know if so. they had maybe dark not. cameras to take pictures in a dark. Maybe you're wrong about that. Yeah, that's like an right illustration to me. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right about that. And that's yeah. appearing in, what is that? That's in Harper's in 1895. Yeah, you're right about that. You're right about that. That's a drawing. Very. Yeah. Yeah, there's a kind of illustration in the early days of photography that are like heavily touched up photographs. Yeah. That could be, they're in between photographs and drawings, but I think that looks like a drawing. Um, yeah, Whitman, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on Walt Whitman, but I know he had a very conflicted um, connection to that scene in those bars. He was always he did. sitting yeah, aside. He did. And he thought yep. they were all kind of professional um, bohemians, like trying to. Yeah, and you know, the comic it, artists. But yeah, I and I, I would say that the comic artists are not all kind of strictly bohemians. I, I describe them kind of as bohemian adjacent. You know, in the book, I try to be really careful not to kind of directly describe them as as bohemians because it's it's more 
I mean, the, I think the kind of cultural ferment happening in New York is broader than just bohemianism, right? It's it's a whole kind of collection of, um, you know, really this new generation of um, artists and writers. I see Dan, Diane Tucker has a hand. Sorry. Hi. Uh, very interesting, and thank you so much. Um, two questions, actually, because I've seen before, too, some of the suggestions between the interplay between the people in the theater and the people doing creating these central yeah. drawings. Yeah. But I'm wondering if you saw, because I thought I might have seen suggested, or did the interplay sort of happen both ways? That um, And that I wonder do, the degree to which you might have seen that uh, – even the composition mm -hmm. of some of the theatrical performances and the way in which narrative was constructed on, on a stage might have also mm -hmm. been um, suggested by, or creators there might have gotten um, suggestions from looking at, at sequential narratives in the and on in the page. And I wondered, you know, what I mean, the degree to which one might have seen that, you know, that it's not just about content; it's also about form, and and that you know this the, the composition of 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 frames or of, of, mm -hmm. um, you know, the equivalent, I don't know, it, on, on stage might've, you know, there, there might've been that interplay between the two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there must've been, um, I think there must've been, I, I don't know that I have, um, kind of, uh, uh, objective proof that, that theatrical producers are looking at the comics. I haven't, I haven't seen anything to that effect kind of in, in like guns diaries or anything like that. Um, but what I would say about it is that when you look at advertisements for theaters, um, you know, and, and like productions, right, they often have a kind of like comic like quality, right? And they're off. So, and I, I think too, just the geography of where they're at, um, it's, it's hard to imagine that with the prevalence of humor magazines um, and the fact that, that uh, comic artists and, and publishers were surely interacting with um, producers. Um, it, it's it's hard for me to to refuse that possibility. I mean, I, it seems overwhelmingly likely. I haven't seen any kind of like smoking gun kind of proof for it, but but it certainly seems very likely. Yeah. Also, um, different question. Um, if that's yeah. okay, I don't want to monopolize. Yeah, please. It. Okay, please. Um, I note that perhaps I missed it. Um, that you don't really talk about, and perhaps it's because you didn't really see much evidence for um, this work, any of this work being at all political. I mean, it sort of seemed as though the work you were looking at, in, you know, the initial yeah. images. Um, and I'm wondering whether in the sequential stuff, you do see a kind of um, decided, uh, you know, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. well, active or, or passive kind yeah. of, um, of sort of, staying away from avoidance of uh yes yeah issues yeah em emphat yes emphatically yes i mean i think that um they're yeah they're they're absolutely um not political in in a kind of explicit way right so i mean when you look at like the broad sides of, of like the 1830s and stuff everything is political everything is is you know andrew jackson or, or whatever um and these are much more studied as i mean studied examples of everyday life right so like like they're they're chronicling um you know social scripts in in the sense that that you know they're kind of looking at the subtleties of the ways that people move about in the city or in the country right or they're they're reproducing entertainment um and they're not typically doing it as as political work um you occasionally do see um political figures kind of seeping in, right? So that that sometimes, for instance, you'll see like comics based on like, I don't know, like Jefferson Davis or something like that. But those really are the exception. And when you when they do pop up, um, they tend to, it, they don't seem to work, right? Like, because it, they, they seem to be sort of one genre getting kind of mapped onto another or one sort of style of expression. So yeah, emphatically, um, you know, the overwhelming amount of, of these works are there for entertainment and they're there for kind of cataloging everyday life and kind of keep finding humor in everyday life. Yeah, I don't know if you looked at all the work of of, of Kepler, of uh, Joseph Kepler, because- uh, That's much that later, that's, degree? yeah, yeah, that's later. Yeah, oh, that's it is later. later, okay. So, yeah, okay. yeah, so, so what I'm looking at is 1840s to 1870s. 
Really? So, yeah, before, yeah, absolutely. So Puck, um, yeah, Puck and Judge, of course, um, famous for those, those kinds of big, you know, editorial cartoons and stuff like that. And I would think of, I think a lot of those images that you're talking about and, and Rich, who's on the call, literally wrote the book on this. Um, so he can correct me if I'm uh, stepping in, in, a, uh, in it at all with, with Puck and Judge. But, you know, I really think, yeah, of course, you've got it right there with you. Right, but I think of those as, as really a kind of um, continuation of, of the tradition you see with broadsheets and broadsides and stuff like that, big kind of editorial cartoons, which are also popping up in the humor magazines, um, but just I, it's, it's distinct from the more sequential kind of stuff. Got it, thank you. So was was um, so you mentioned these French the influence of these French yeah. comics, but I'm, yeah. but so what Punch started what eighteen forty, the, the, mm -hmm. the Brit so some of the layouts of those uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. like yeah, they're the they're by Punch. and the, yeah. the idea of these play script cartoons with uh, dialogue, yeah. long dialogues. Yeah, you see some of those in Punch. Um, these comic the the French magazines too tend to emphasize much more of sequential stuff. Punch isn't you know it's funny because when you look back at those early punch issues, the early ones aren't nearly as sequential, right? Like you see some stuff when when we're kind of getting it, like what David Kunzel talks about in, in um, that rebirth of the the English comic strip book, right? But that's all kind of coming after the eighteen forties with Punch. Um, you do in, in the U.S. see a number of punch clones through the 1840s um, and the comics or, and the magazine. So here I'm thinking of like Yankee Doodle and to some extent, something like John Donkey or, or Judy, which is very really kind of self-consciously um, described as, as a sort of punch copy, right? Um, those are not doing as much kind of sequential work. It's really when you get into Yankee notions and you start seeing um, the influences of, of like the later issues of um, L'Illustration um, kind of coming into um, his his view, I think. And and of course, Rudolf Terpfer, right? Um, that, that the American comic strips really, I think, change fundamentally. Yeah. So, and where did the... Um... I don't think of the examples you showed us from the uh, the trip on the Nile, the, the Hoppins. Yeah. Where did the text, how did the text appear in that book? The text appears, so those are, um, those are graphic albums. So it's like you have your, um, you have kind of a plate on one side and then the, um, and then the text on the other. So they're not appearing as captions in that book. He's kind of changed his approach by then, right? Um, they're much more kind of sketchbook types of, of formats. Right. And it's it's typeset or handwritten? The it's typeset. Um, well, let me see if I, I think I even have a kind of full copy of this. Let me see if I can pull it up here. What? Yeah. Well, I have a question on that map you show of Lower Manhattan. What is yeah. that arrow? Is that pointing to a specific place? It's just that's pointing. Yeah, that's pointing to the newspaper row. Yeah. Well, I think it's much further uptown. Is it further up? Okay. Yeah, near City Hall. Okay. That's a very detailed map. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. I think it's way down at the battery. That's why I was. Is I it? was pointing. Okay. To some no, you're probably right. You, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. It was let's get to some place that you didn't mention. Yeah, yeah those we could hop in up here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so with hop in, here's here's a reproduction. So what you would see is this kind of like text. Right. And then you'd get a page like explaining it. Right. So you know. it's not text too much. Not in the uh, image. Right? It, no, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Diane. Um, <laughs> I wonder what you do with something I don't. I suspect you've seen um, some of the David Claypool Johnston, where um, yeah, yeah, with uh, this the sequence in which um, there's a kind of drunk with a bald head, and someone comes and um, draws a face on it, and it seems as yeah. Good. Um, Sleeper and marker, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder, um, in terms of your uh, whether that's sort of kind of um, an experiment that you know whether that doesn't kind of fit into your yeah. categorization because it's not all on a single page, or whether you think it's sort of it's a, it's kind of just experimental work that's kind of on the pathway toward the kind of yeah. thing you're talking about. John's, or? Yeah, Johnston was originally going to be in the book, so. Um, and I think that, like, his stuff is very much, like, I just gave a paper on this. Um, it's wit-driven, you know, so so it's driven by, like, sequences of puns and, and like, verbal conceits a lot of the time, right? And we see that a lot with, like, genre paintings, right? And so you, I think that you can trace a pretty clear line between the work that he's doing and their work. I think you're supposed to kind of, like, hunt around in the image for like little gags and right. I mean, if you think about like sleeper and marker, um, you know, there's, especially in the, the like broadsheet version of it, there's like writing up on the wall, I think, you know, and, and they're kind of like little visual gags. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, um, it's, it's in that kind of tradition where they're sort of working their way towards um, something like sequential art. Johnston, you know, it's, it's, he's not part of that like breakthrough in 18, 52 with like T.W. Strong or, you know, with with um, the graphic album of, of Obadiah Oldbuck in 1842. He's he's kind of off doing his own thing. Um, and, and Johnson himself is really, I mean, he has, he will say things in like advertisements, um, you know, comparing his own work. What does he call them? He, he calls it like um, fantastic linear representations, I think, and odd combinations of language. And then he'll go on to like compare himself to like John Milton, you know, and he's doing that like tongue in cheek, right? Um, but he's also not really, you know, like he's, I think even in the 1830s, somebody like DC Johnston is saying, you know, um, some of the possibilities that are being introduced by new print technologies, you know, the combination of illustration and text in a much more robust way, right, is creating a new media, right? Um, and something I would say too with Johnston, I don't know, have you seen like scraps, his his scrapbook kind of stuff? I've seen some of it, not a lot. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that often gets compared to like George Cruikshank and, and Seymour. And I think something that's interesting there is that, that Johnson actually precedes um, the the most popular kind of scrapbook work by by Cruikshank and, and others. So, you know, in some ways he's kind of ahead of the curve of those those figures. You mentioned having done a presentation. Is that something you share with cur the curious? Oh, well, that was in, I'm sorry, that was the conference. Yeah, that oh, was okay. that was in Pasadena last week. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, two weeks ago. Not a question. Am I unmuted? I can't figure yeah, out. Yeah, we're here. We can, we can hear okay, you. Okay, good. Hear you. Yeah. I just, uh, I had a question. Uh, when I signed on, I was late. You were showing a picture of, uh, of flying eyeballs with uh, butterflies. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Was just, yeah. I was wondering what that was. Sure, sure. I'll I mean, I, I can't, I, I was... I, I didn't yeah. think to uh, to to uh, take that information down. I'll, yeah, I'll pull that back up. Um, let's see. Okay. And so that was from Obadiah Oldbuck, which was this was a serialized um, picture story that appeared in Yankee Notions in 1852. Okay. And it's really, you know, it's it's an homage or a knockoff or a copy or whatever of Rudolf Tupfer's 
graphic albums, right? So so when Terp First stuff comes over to the US um, as a bootleg, it gets the title Obadiah Old Buck. Um, and so Yankee oh. Notions comes back with this thing called Jeremiah Old Pot. Um, you know, and, and what they're probably doing is reusing illustrations, maybe plates, but probably just illustrations from um, French comics that are appear appearing in L'Illustration. Um, and so even this thing with like the, the eyeballs, they might be eyeballs in the original. They might be butterflies. It's it's unclear, but um, they're they're doing this kind of thing where where they're writing in captions saying, "Yeah, these are eyeballs kind of flying out," and it's it's really kind of madcap humor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really. I mean, the only reason has really spooked me out. Actually, I was I'm drawing flying eyeballs, like as I'm signing oh, okay. on. And oh, I'm, that's funny. You're talking yeah. about flying eyeballs. That's pretty weird. So yeah, I thought yeah. I at least needed to get the history of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's good. So, is there a text below that image? In the um, is that like yeah? The other? There is yeah. The, so that explains so the it's like the other ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, with those and with pull that back up um on the page for Obadiah old buck it looks like this where there are longer captions um like really long captions um that approach doesn't last very long in the magazines they they very very quickly move over to kind of less you know kind of quicker uh types of of comics that that have far less involved captions but but in through the early 1850s this is really common to see did you do much more uh, or discover much more about these um, shops selling these kinds of things these uh i know there was a strange thing i read about once that the the fence around city hall used to hmm. be um was used to sell uh printed sheet music and other Huh, that's awesome. interesting. I don't know if you but yeah, I mean is that the only image you saw of a New York print shop? That... That's the only image that I've seen. Yeah. I mean there are very famous images of, of um those types of shops in Paris, for instance, right? Like you'll see that come up with the Philippon Daumier scandal mm -hmm. and all that. Um, but you see advertisements too for you know they're they're selling printed goods and they're selling things kind of out in, in the streets. So there's there's good evidence to suggest that, yeah. So what what how would you describe the audience for these mm -hmm. uh yeah firing to the middle class or upper middle class? I yeah, I would say it's a it's it's a middle class audience. Um and at least if you read, you know, I think it's kind of mixed on who it's being pitched to and who's actually reading it. Um, because on the one hand, if if you read like the letters columns or, or the letters from the editor, most of them will announce um, their comics as being for like everyone, right? So they'll say for children, you know, for women, for men. Um, but then when you get into the, the comics themselves, I think most of the, the comics, they, they read to me as a male working to middle class kind of audience. You know, and th this can, can vary a lot from publication to publication. Um, so, for instance, something like Vanity Fair is very, like, notoriously bohemian influenced. Um, whereas, like, you know, I talked a little bit about knickknacks in the 1860s. Um, you literally see... Um, advertisements for things like sewing implements you see comics that are that are pitched specifically towards what i would regard as, as a, a female audience um you know that's a kind of unusual case um other ones like leslie's budget of fun strikes me as as being more sort of family oriented right kind of moving away from that working to middle class male audience 
So some of that can kind of depend from publication to publication. Hmm. Hmm. Anybody else? If not, uh, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Well, great thank material. you for having me Thanks tonight. For yeah. Finding all this material, taking it. Yeah. Out. And I'm sure. Everyone will be trying to look it up now. Yeah. So you brought it all back to life in a, in a way. I, and uh, if there are no other questions or comments, everybody's applauding with their little icons. Hmm. Well, thank you. Very enlightening. Okay. Thank you. Thank, okay. Thank you. Everybody.